Good morning. And a very warm welcome to our worship this morning. This morning we have with us the Reverend Ian Payton, who is, our, is now our interim moderator. Uh, Ian is taking service this week and next week, and no doubt a few more in the times to come. Uh, but we are very grateful to you, Ian, for, for taking on the job of the interim moderator here, and we're delighted that you have uh, agreed to do this. Uh, so thank you very much, and uh, we look forward to you leading our worship. Thank you very much, Helen May. <clears throat> um, before we start this morning, I just uh, I do want to <clears throat> apologise for the fact that the last twice I was supposed to be here, actually, I wasn't, because of each time I was in hospital. Now, if that sounds terribly dramatic, once it was one night, once it was two, um, for different things, but nothing that was, um, nothing that other people don't have. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, I'm now fully recovered, and, um, and I can walk up and down these steps now far better than I could when last time. <laughs> I was, I was here. <clears throat> and so, as um, Helen May has said, I was recently appointed by the Presbytery to be the interim moderator in succession to the Reverend Mary Perkins. Um, <clears throat> it wasn't an appointment that I saw coming, I would have to say, but um, in many ways <clears throat> it is a kind of administrative thing, really, because the Reverend Alec Mitchell will still arrange the services, and along with him and with Ian Roy, I'll take my share of them. Um, so, uh, just to, to know that. Um, the other intimation today is just to <coughs> announce the death of Alec Phillip, who is a member of the congregation here. <coughs> I gather he worshipped quite a lot along at Trinity Gas, but um, we don't have any arrangements yet for his funeral, but um, I'm sure that will be announced next week. <clears throat> now, the theme of the service this morning <clears throat> is facing up to the trials and the storms that we all face as we go through life. To many people, we're living in quite troubling times just now. So, we're going to look at that within the context of the gospel narrative in St. Mark about Jesus' disciples rowing against the strong wind on the Sea of Galilee, and how then Jesus came to them walking on the water to still their fears and to still the storm without. So that's really the, the theme of the service this morning. So let's worship God. We're going to begin with hymn number not quite sure. Yes, there we are. Hymn 225. Uh, I just changed the first hymn yesterday, um, and I thought we'd have to have it this week because summer suns have been glowing, and I'm frankly not sure that by next week they're still going to be. So we'll sing it now while it's still dry. Summer suns are glowing over land and sea.
Now let's join in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, merciful Savior, we give you thanks. We give you thanks that summer suns have been glowing over this land over the recent weeks. And we give you thanks for the sense of uplift that that brings to us all, a sense of brightness and goodness and fairness and a sense of your love. And so we pray, Lord, today that you will accept our worship, that you will hear our praise, that you'll answer our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Most gracious God, we are ashamed to confess that we've tried your patience and grieved your Holy Spirit. We've been absorbed with material things as if our life depended on them. We spent far too much time on our own concerns <coughs> and our pleasures and thought too highly of ourselves. And we, are, we who are not quite honest and truthful have begun to believe sometimes that we are saints ourselves. So Lord, please forgive us Forgive us for the sins of which we all fall guilty. And forgive us too for the more personal sins which are ours alone. And so, Almighty God, we lament what is past and we're resolved to do better in the future. But because we're weak and liable to sin, we need your strong and constant help. So, Lord, save us from pride and an arrogant spirit. Save us from a sharp tongue and an evil temper. Save us from envy of the wealthy and important people. And save us from a listless, joyless state of mind. Lord, help us to get our lives together, to concentrate on the positives, and to be thankful. And so hear us now as we pray together and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> now, this is normally a time when we talk to children. <clears throat> there aren't any. My children's talk today is far too valuable to be wasted on adults. <laughs> You'll get it later. Let's sing again. <clears throat> In 553, Just as I am, without one plea. <clears throat> Right. 
Good morning, everyone. This morning's reading, as Ian has intimated, is taken from the book of Mark, chapter 6, and reading from verses 41 to 56. If you have access to a pew Bible, it's on page 51 of the New Testament section. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. The passage tells about the stilling of the storm by Jesus, but I'm going to start a few verses earlier, giving an account of the feeding of the 5,000, and this is simply to place the main text of the reading in context. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up toward heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. He also divided the fish for everyone to share. They all ate as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish. A total of 5,000 men and their families were fed from those loaves. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and head across the lake to Bethsaida, while he sent the people home. After telling everyone goodbye, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Late that night, the disciples were in their boat in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was alone on land. He saw they were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against the wind and the waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came towards them, walking on the water. He intended to go past them, but when they saw him walking on the water, they cried out in terror, thinking he was a ghost. They were terrified when they saw him. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I am here. Then he climbed into the boat and the wind stopped. They were totally amazed, for they still didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves. Their hearts were too hard to take it in. After they had crossed the lake, they landed at Gennesaret. They brought the boat to the shore and climbed out. The people recognized Jesus at once, and they ran throughout the whole area, carrying sick people on mats to wherever they heard he was. Wherever he went, in villages, cities, or the countryside, they brought the sick out to the marketplaces. They begged him to let the sick touch at least the fringe of his robe, and all who touched were healed. Amen. Thanks be to God for this reading of his holy word. Thank you very much, Sandy. Thank you. And so thinking about stillness and storms. So before the sermon, let's him sing hymn 755, Be still and know that I am God.
expectation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. And so our uh, text this morning from that uh, passage which Sandy read about the stilling of the storm. Immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Now, I don't know how you feel about life just now. There's many people who are really very concerned about the way that the world is going. From our perspective here, who might have said 16 months ago that there would still be a war raging in and around Ukraine? What proportion of people in our country and some others are getting really worried now about the rise of power in China? Such that the United States has just sent one of their senior envoys there to try to keep relations positive. And I read a statistic just a couple of weeks ago which said that just over 50% of 18 to 24 year olds in this country feel that on account of climate change, the world will probably come to an end within their lifetime. Now, these are big issues, and they're worrying issues for all of us. So, what does our faith have to say to us that might sort of calm us down a little bit as people who, to many, feel that they're facing an uncertain future? Well, we've read about Jesus stilling the storm on the Sea of Galilee, a storm which was very real to the disciples who were in the middle of it. And I just want to look at that with you and see whether we can maybe pull some strands of reassurance out of that. As most of you probably know, I spent a few years as the minister of the St. Andrew's Scots Memorial Church in Jerusalem. Now, the Church of Scotland has a church and a study centre and accommodation for about 50 people in a guest house and a flat for the minister, all in one complex in Jerusalem. And we also have a small church in Tiberias, which is about 90 miles away, situated beside the Sea of Galilee. Now, the service in Jerusalem when I was there was at 10 o'clock, and I think it still is, and the one in Tiberias is at 6 o'clock in the evening. So, when the minister at Tiberias was not there, my wife and I had to drive about the 90 miles on a Sunday afternoon in order to lead the evening service in Tiberias. Now, just about always when you arrive at Tiberias, which is situated right on the Sea of Galilee, Just about always, it was windy, even although we had left a perfectly uh, stable and still day in Jerusalem. Now, as as we all know, when it's windy here and you're getting out of the car, it's quite usual to sort of brace yourself for the cold air that's going to blast you. So it took some use It took some time getting used to the fact that in all except the dead of winter, it was a warm wind that was blowing. Now, I don't know enough about these things, but I understand that it's something to do with the the thermals and the position of the hills and the Jordan Valley, all which lies, within which lies the Sea of Galilee. But the fact is that the Sea of Galilee can be perfectly still and calm in the mornings, just like it is on that slide just now. But that later in the afternoon, a wind gets up, and the water, which has been still as a mill pond, becomes rougher. And that can last much of the night until it stills down again before dawn. Now, this has been going on, one presumes, since creation. 
In the time of Jesus, it certainly must have been like that, <clears throat> and it hasn't changed. And St. Mark tells us that just before the incident about the stilling of the storm, <clears throat> that Jesus had been talking to a crowd. The time that when he performed this miracle that we know was the feeding of the 5,000, the loaves and the fishes. We read the, sort of the tail end of that, as Sandy said, just as a, um, to set this in context. So at that stage, the water must have been reasonably calm and the moon quite still. Otherwise, nobody would have heard Jesus when he was addressing a crowd. <clears throat> we also know from Scripture that just before this incident, the crowd were at Bethsaida, which is way up at the top of the Lake of Galilee, but that the, the miracle of the loaves and the fishes took place halfway down the east side. Now, for a crowd to get there, you don't just walk round the lake because the sea of the, the River Jordan comes into it. So you've got to come along, and then in order to ford the Jordan, you have to walk a couple of miles up it, over, back down, and then round to the Mount of Beatitudes area where this feeding of the 5,000 took place. So we know that it must have been the afternoon before the crowd have got there. But then Mark tells us that after the crowd had been satisfied, had their fill of the bread and the fish, <clears throat> the disciples were instructed to gather up all the scraps that had been left around. And he then instructed the disciples to get into a boat and to head for Bethsaida up at the north of the lake where some of them lived, whilst he, Jesus, dismissed the crowd. Now you can imagine that the disciples could have got into the boat quickly enough and probably on the way up would go back to their task of doing some fishing. But as far as Jesus was concerned, dismissing that number of people from the land would have taken quite some time. <clears throat> now, just as an aside, some theologians who've studied the feeding of the 5,000 have said really it was a bit of a failure in that neither the crowd nor the disciples got the message that Jesus really intended to convey. That Jesus had hoped that the crowd, as the recipients of the miracle, would join him in thanking God. But according to St. John, who records the same incident, the crowd rushed to make Jesus king. But Jesus had intended that his disciples, as participants in the miracle, would take a giant step forward in the recognition that he was the Christ. But instead, goes the argument, the impression that disciples, each with one basket of food, stood there flat-footed and complained about what they were to do with all the leftovers. <clears throat> and so it is with a, an open show of disappointment, according to that, that Jesus sends both groups away, the crowd back to their homes, and more importantly, the disciples to go and do some fishing and then to make their way by boat up to the north end of the lake. Jesus now needs to regain his perspective and restore his patience, all in the presence of God his Father. So Jesus retreated to pray. Jesus prayed well into the night. The disciples went fishing. And then the next thing that happens is that it leads us to realize that sometimes God lets us come to the end of our human resources in order to get our attention because Mark's account of this miracle of Jesus walking towards the disciples on the surface of the water carries the inference that Jesus sees the disciples straining against the wind in the boat when he looked up from his prayers at nightfall. <clears throat> Just as I said at the beginning, up springs the water, the wind, later in the day, and the sea is rough. 
But did Jesus go straight out to the disciples? Clearly, no, he didn't. Because Mark tells us a point that he went to them. It says in original scripture during the fourth watch of the night. In the reading we had today, it said 3 a.m. Well, that's right, because when would it be? Well, night for the Jews was 12 hours from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. the next morning. And a watch was three hours long. So if you work it out, the fourth watch is from 3 a.m. until 6. And it was during that time that Jesus went to them. So our question for us, is Jesus cruel to let the disciples row all night? Perhaps when he first looked out to see them, they're frustrated, but they're not desperate. After all, they're strong fishermen who knew the sea and the winds, and they were probably perfectly confident they'd still make it to their destination. But some hours later, Jesus clearly looked up again and sees that they've really made no progress, that their strength is gone, their reserves are raw, and their minds are more properly filled with fear. Perhaps one more angry wave is going to swamp their boat. <clears throat> the desperate disciples need a dramatic event, not just to save them from drowning, but to shock them wide awake and the reality <clears throat> of this supernatural. For up until that point, I think we could say that their thinking about Jesus generally would be to put him in the category of almost God. But now, perhaps, the time had come just to go a stage further. And so, stepping onto the water and walking into the wind, Jesus moves towards them. The disciples almost miss them, according to Scripture, because they're paralyzed with fear and they're preoccupied, really, now with their survival. But then we imagine one lifts his head and sees this image of Jesus walking towards them. Is this a ghost? No, no, it's not a ghost. Are we going mad? Can you just imagine panic ricocheting, ricocheting through this boat when a voice speaks through the howling wind, be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Jesus, records Mark, got into the boat beside them. So what can we learn from this? Sometimes God lets us come to the end of our human resources <coughs> in order to get our attention. It doesn't start by overruling the forces of nature, but just rather by telling us to look up telling us to see the reality of his presence, his spirit round us, to calm us down. Because, you know, in all of the miracles, it's Jesus' presence that is first and foremost. And that can apply to us just as much as it applied to the disciples in the boat. We know that if Jesus is with us, in his spirit, if we can feel that he's close to us and understands what we're facing up to, then it's his presence that's first and foremost. And that's why prayer is so important. Because if we know that he is with us in the middle of any of life's storms, then the stilling of the sea and the stopping of the winds are incidental. <clears throat> when Jesus says to you or to me, look up, cheer up, calm down, then he has the power to back up his words with action. So in times of trouble, don't ever feel that you're alone. You're not. Because if you think back to the stilling of the storm here, you realize that when Jesus really saw his friends in trouble, his own problems were set aside. 
The time of prayer for him was past. Time of action had come. He forgot himself, and he went immediately to the aid of his friends. It's the very essence of Jesus. No cry of human need to him that surpasses all other claims. It's hard for us to know what happened that night. Indeed, we never will know, really. But what we do know is that he came to the disciples and their storm became calm. With him beside them, nothing mattered anymore. So let's just take this as a very physical manifestation of what happens in every life your life and mine, there are times when we all get into a panic. There's times when we all feel up against it. Here's a wee quote from, on this incident from St. Augustine. A Christian writer records that Augustine, writing about this, said, Jesus came treading the waves, and so he puts all the swelling incidents of life under his feet. Christians, why afraid? You know, it's a simple fact of life, a fact which has been proved by thousands of men and women in every generation, that when Christ is here, the storm becomes a calm. The tumult becomes a peace. The insurmountable problem which was the subject of the time of panic or, de or depression or whatever, becomes possible when Christ is invited into your life and mine to share it. <clears throat> the unbearable becomes bearable, and people pass the breaking point, but they don't break. To walk with Christ will be for us also the conquest of the storm. <clears throat> You know, it's very clever that there's little nuances that are there in the gospel that we don't always immediately recognize. Because almost as an afterthought, Mark tells us how far off course the disciples had actually been blown. They had started from the west side of the lake, on the west side of Galilee, and Jesus had told them to head for Bethsaida, which is located up in the north. But by the next morning, after being rescued by Jesus from the nightmare, St. Mark tells us that they anchored off the shore of Gennesaret. Now, Gennesaret is actually quite far south, and it's on the eastern side. And Mark tells us that, and he says, when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and moored to the shore, because there was work to do there, and Jesus set about doing it. So there's a divine purpose in everything. We've just got to look for it. And in these uncertain days, which many feel that we're in now, well, you know, this is the time that we need, too, to look beyond ourselves and our own problems towards a divine purpose. We need to open our lives to Jesus at his prompting. Because he knows what lies ahead. We don't always know that. We are to submit to his guidance, knowing that he has our best interests at heart. So in the storms of life, just as in the quieter times, Jesus is always with us and ready to help us if we let him into our hearts and into our lives. As Mark recounts, immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Thanks be to God for this preaching of his word, and to him be the praise and the glory. Amen. Now we're going to sing another hymn. Number 509 in the hymn book, Jesus calls us o'er the tumult of our life's wild, restless sea.
509. And so now our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. Let us pray. Unto you, O Lord, we give thanks. Unto you, the only true and living God, we give thanks for creating, for sustaining, and for developing humankind through unimaginable centuries. We praise you for our slow growth in knowledge and trust for our long search for you through superstition and idolatry and paganism. We bless you for the work of your Holy Spirit in good people in all ages and nations. Remembering the Hebrew prophets who left us a great and partial revelation of your heart and mind. But most of all, we praise you for the unique and perfect revelation embodied in Jesus Christ. By his light we see. By his teaching we learn your love. By his life we model our lives. And by his death we die to sin. And by his resurrection we hope to be raised to heaven. And therefore, Lord, our hearts bless you our lips praise you, and our lives glorify you now and forevermore. We give thanks, Lord, for the lives and the freedom to use them in the way that we want. But we know that you stand behind us, and whenever we face stormy seas and uncertain times, that is when you're really close to us. So be close to us now, Lord, as we remember the needs of others. We pray today once again for the people of Ukraine and Russia who have been displaced by war and aggression, and particularly also by flooding. People in other countries who are wandering in search of food, and especially water people who have been separated from family and other loved ones, and those who are mourning those who have died because of the evil intentions of others, or because of greater world problems that neither they nor we can control. 
And we pray for our own country, the United Kingdom, which seems to be facing so many problems just now. People going on strike for a larger share of wealth that we do not have. For a health service under severe strain. For our children not getting their full education to which they're entitled. And so many other reasons. So Lord, may there come a time soon when we all settle down to a more normal life. Realizing that we cannot have all that we want but that mutual respect and love are uppermost in our lives and in the lives of our fellow men and women. And Lord, we pray for our own families and our loved ones. Hear us as we pray for them in quietness and remembering to pray for situations that we face and remembering any who may have asked us to pray for them today. So Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. And now to him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and evermore. Amen. And so we now close the service by singing the hymn, Will Your Anchor Hold in the Storms of Life?
so now go forth in peace, and may the peace of God go with you. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you, and remain with you this day henceforth and forevermore. Amen.